So join me in welcoming Dr. Catherine Jones, um, as we said, cardiothoracic radiologist and one of our very first B readers. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, I'm not sure what, uh, what was wrong with the presentation. There's nothing too fancy in it, so hopefully we don't find anything um, glitching as we go through. Um, thank you for having me here. Um, my first um, visit to this conference. But I think I've um, been involved in this space for about five years. I've done quite a lot of work in occupational lung disease imaging and it's something that affects all of your workers, whether they're in the coal mines, whether they're in hard rock mining, and in many of the associated industries which have dust exposure. So I'm going to run through um, what occupational lung disease looks like in terms of imaging, where we're at currently with screening as well as diagnosing this on imaging, and where we're looking to move to in the future. When we talk about occupational lung disease, it means a whole bunch of different things. You know, the most common one being asthma, all the way through to emphysema, pneumoconiosis, black lung, silicosis, uh, and lung cancer. You know, so exposure to dust over a long period of time increases your risk of lung cancer and also exposure to asbestos and then the subsequent risk of fibrosis of the lung or scarring uh, and mesothelioma, which is another form of cancer. How does radiology or imaging play into this entire process? Well, it's a really key part of diagnosing disease. It's not the only part. We also talk about your breathing function uh, and we also talk about symptoms and your ability to exercise, so exercise tolerance. Uh, but every time we do some form of imaging, whether it's for screening purposes, for diagnosing or for monitoring disease, we always need to take into account the occupational history of the worker. That's absolutely vital to help us make a diagnosis with confidence the respiratory function, so spirometry, when you breathe into the tube uh, during your surveillance and your screening appointments. Ongoing monitoring. So we may find something which isn't 100% normal and whether we're confident enough to give a diagnosis then or whether we say we'd like to come back and see what it looks like in three months or six months time, that monitoring component of imaging is a really important part. Uh, occasionally we find something that we are concerned enough could be cancer that we say actually I feel like we need to put a needle in and get some form of tissue to send to the pathology lab and imaging often plays a significant role there in targeting the right tissue. So I'm going to show some cases um, throughout the presentation. These are obviously are, are medical imaging and I know most of you have uh, no real experience in this but it's a way of sort of demonstrating uh, the changes in the scarring that you can find in someone's lung. Even though this patient is a stonemason, the same disease can be found in anyone working in a mine or a quarry. And this person has had exposure for 19 years. One thing we know about black lung and silicosis is that normally this takes at least 10 years for the process to develop in the lungs. So that's 10 years after you start being exposed to the dust. It's also dependent upon what the concentration of dust is like during that period of time. And it can develop sooner in people exposed to heavy dust loads. This image here shows the patient's lungs that have all these little white dots all the way through it. There's more white dots than there should be. And each one of those white dots is a little bit of dust which has been absorbed into the lungs and the lungs are unable to cough it back out. And when that happens, you get a little reaction as like a scar around that bit of dust. And if those tiny little bits of scar start to get big enough that you can see them on a CT scan, because that's what this picture is, then it tells me that you've got visible scar that's stopping your lungs from expanding. So when you breathe in and breathe out, that ability to expand your lungs and get oxygen in, you start to lose that ability to do that. And over time, and I'll show you some more uh, florid examples throughout the talk, over time it really does restrict your ability to get about your daily activities. Really importantly, it's usually the upper parts of the lungs. 
And so when we see this on an image, we know in someone who's been exposed to dust, this isn't asthma, it's not pneumonia, it's, it's not something else that could affect your lungs, this is going to be something related to the dust. And it's all got to do with the size of the particle and how big it needs to be to get into different parts of your um, airways. We also see some other signs on CTs that don't relate necessarily to the lungs, but starts to reflect absorption of the dust into the rest of the body through the lymphatics. And here's an example, again, I know difficult for non-radiologists to interpret, you know, a really clear finding that to me, this person, even if the lungs were pristine, this person is starting to absorb the dust into their lymphatic system. There's been an awful lot happening in the last five years in this space in Australia to try to establish again what is the background prevalence of disease in workers involved in the mining, quarrying, construction and other associated industries. And we've had a couple of really key position statements have come out. The one on the left there came from the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Radiologists, so the college to which I belong as an imaging specialist, and that came out in 2019 really around the diagnosis of silicosis and other pneumoconiosis like black lung. And then the National Guidance for Doctors, which you can see on the right, came out last year. And this is really about assessing people who come to you having been exposed to respirable crystalline silica. So silica dust, which has been small enough uh, to absorb into the airways, um, but not so small uh, that they then have trouble um, uh, getting rid of it. A lot of you have probably heard about the ILO chest x-ray. And this was a thing that came about in the early 80s um, through the International Labour Organization, where there was, I guess, a recognized need at that point to try to standardize how people interpreting these x-rays could describe the severity of the changes on them. And, you know, we have these standardized images that have been around for a long time now that give us an idea about what is normal and what is abnormal and how to, to describe the shape, the size, the distribution and um, the severity of the changes on the x-ray. There's a form that goes with it which when you ask for an ILO chest x-ray someone like me will fill in a form like this and it goes through a whole heap of different things about the x-ray, about the lungs, about the lining of the lungs, looking for changes related to asbestos exposure and other things as well, like is there a you know, lung cancer there? Does it look like you might have scarring? Does it look like you have you know, a fractured rib? A whole bunch of other things that could be relevant to us when we look at any chest x-ray. There's lots of different components to it. There are some advantages of standardizing our reports. It means that I can look at a chest x-ray and that somebody else who's been trained to look at the same classification system should give the same report. So it's very reproducible between different readers, which is an improvement. It means that I have to look at every single part of that chest x-ray for things that could be related to that dust exposure. So it makes me go through a system. It means that anyone who's a B reader, and a B reader is simply a radiologist who has demonstrated additional training and expertise in this uh, use of this classification system, that we have to have gone through that process and have to have demonstrated it in an exam. However, there are some disadvantages of this system as well, and that is that a chest x-ray can be a very blunt tool when it comes to picking up the early changes of disease. By the time I can see it on a chest x-ray, it might be relatively well advanced. Uh, and the early changes of the black lung and the silicosis are often negative on the chest x-ray. And it's also quite time consuming uh, to fill in the forms. And most radiologists out there, you know, working in, in medicine, aren't familiar with this system. This is a pretty niche area of medical imaging. So we don't have hundreds of people around the world who are qualified to do this. Um, it's a very small number. However, momentum really started um, getting underway when groups of radiologists and respiratory physicians around the country started to sort of talk to each other and say, hey, I'm seeing another case of silicosis. What about you? Yeah, me too. And we started to realize that 
more and more of our patients were coming from the industries that were exposed to dust. And we started to get these sorts of, um, this is in 2019, this was a preliminary warning that you know, a group of us put together and said, you know, it's a warning from Australia that this disease of silicosis, black lung, these have not gone away. And it really highlighted in one of our big respiratory medicine journals that asking an occupational history is, that, is vital when we see people presenting with symptoms. It's not just happening here in Australia. As soon as we started um, telling the world about it, uh, there started to become reports coming from other countries. So, you know, from the US um, and particularly from China. Artif artificial stone, um, I understand, is a completely different uh, area to mining. But what it does is it, it highlights that people exposed to silica are really at risk of developing disease. And stonemasons who work with artificial stone are exposed to really high concentrations of it in their work. It tells us that people can easily be exposed to dangerous levels of silica in other parts of your industry. Not necessarily, you know, in a particular niche area like, you know, making kitchen countertops. And it really shone that spotlight onto the industry of anyone exposed to silica. Are we managing their risk as well? Now, one of the really um, key developments in this entire space of screening and regulation is the debate about how we should be assessing people's lungs when they come for their screening test. Should we continue doing the chest x-ray or should we require people to do a CT scan? And why should we do a CT? Well, chest x-ray has the advantage of being really easily available. It's you know, available pretty much in every town in Australia. However, as I've said, it lacks any sensitivity or ability to pick up the really early changes of these conditions in the lungs. And more than 10% of these can be falsely negative. And obviously that depends on who your, your workers are that are coming through the screening program, but 10% is a large number of people that we give a clean bill of health to, to find out that actually maybe they weren't negative at all. When we do a CT scan, we do a special protocol of the CT scan, and that has much greater sensitivity for picking up the changes of the disease. That means that of everyone that comes through the screening program with disease, the ones who are positive will be far more likely to be picked up. However, it does have its disadvantages. It is more expensive. It's not available in every town in Australia. It is more time consuming for people like me to report because it's hundreds of images, not one or two images. Um, and there is slightly more radiation dose given to the patient as well. However, like with everything in technology, in the last 10 years, we've made some pretty significant advancements. So the, the amount of radiation dose, or the x-ray dose that we give to the worker, has come down dramatically in the last 10 years. It is now less than 20% of what we would have done tw uh, 10 years ago. In addition to that, we have different technologies available to us to do really low dose CT, which is pretty much the same radiation dose as giving someone a chest x-ray. So we need to balance the availability of that really new technology and the benefits of that uh, to you know, consider whether some of our patients coming for screening from your industry would benefit more from a CT than from an x-ray. So here's an example. Again, I know you're not imaging specialists, but on the left, we have an imaging um, example of a chest X-ray, which I reported as normal. It looks like a normal X-ray. The same person came back to have a CT scan because they developed symptoms shortly thereafter. And there are lots of little dots throughout the lungs, and he also has emphysema up in the top of his lungs. And this man has simple black lung. Simple, simply meaning it hasn't started to form that horrible scarring that we see in the more advanced cases. So here is a person who has signs that those little dust particles are big enough now to see on a CT scan. They're one or two millimeters, but there's hundreds of them through the lungs. He hasn't progressed yet to the point where those nodules are starting to come together and, and give traction and pull the lung around it. And when that happens, you really do start to be able to notice restriction in your ability to breathe. Here's another example. The chest x-ray is normal. 
and the CET unfortunately shows hundreds and hundreds of these small nodules um, representing, again, those retained dust particles throughout the lungs. What we also find is that people who are presenting when they are new to the industry occasionally start to develop breathing problems within the first six to 12 months or within the first two or three years. And those people, for whatever reason, are more susceptible to the effects of dust. And once they start to develop symptoms, if we scan them with a CT, we can see the inflammation within the lungs as the lungs are trying desperately to get rid of all of the dust that's in there. So for a small minority of your workers who start to exhibit problems within the first couple of years of working, CT is certainly the, the preferred modality to investigate people in that situation. As with everything in medicine, however, and I suspect in your industry as well, everything has a standard and a classification. So CT um, has a classification uh, system in place called ICOERD, and it is, uh, again, a very niche area within medical imaging as a whole. And it looks at what changes we see on the CT scan, which may be related to your dust exposure. There's no magic cutoff number that above a certain score it's going to be positive and below a certain score it's negative. What it is, however, is a way to document the state of someone's lungs at a point in time, to compare them to another point in time. And it gives us an idea about if there is any disease that's progressing, stabilizing, or getting better. Lots of things, you know, these are quite time consuming reports to make. It includes the changes that could be there due to emphysema, so the big holes in the lung that develop when you've been exposed to either smoking um, or to dust. Um, and it also looks for large opacities, which is a polite way of saying things that could be lung cancer. And there's been quite a, um, a lot of interest in whether the X-ray and the CT results can be comparable. Does a certain severity on the X-ray correspond to a severity on the CT? And so there have been you know, some results. This is one from Japan and Germany as a, um, a multi-center trial to demonstrate that actually it's not a bad correlation. Um, mostly in agreement, noting that the CT is far better at picking up some of the earlier changes uh, than, than the X-ray will be. So we had a uh, statement coming out from the Thoracic Society of Australia and New Zealand a couple of years ago saying that when we do the CT scans for these patients, we really need someone experienced in the use of this classification system to be interpreting the images, which uh, my radiology college was very supportive of. Because what it comes down to is you want people with the right expertise looking at these cases. There's nothing worse than you know, saying to somebody, oh, I didn't see anything, I think you're okay, when they're not. Um, and so this is about, again, improving the standard of care that we're giving to all of the workers here. We know that when we have um, certain severity scores, either on the X-ray result or on the CT result, that those scores in themselves are pretty indicative of the risk of that worker developing significant disease, which may shorten their lives. And if we can intervene at an earlier stage, and you know, reduce or eliminate the dust exposure and prevent that progression. You know, that's in everybody's interest, particularly that of the worker. We have some more evidence that's coming out and we also have our own radiology evidence and, and guidelines here in Australia to say that we expect and we, um, we require that the interactions between you know, the worker, the, the local doctor, the radiologist, the occupational physician, that we all work together to make sure that the person is diagnosed correctly and then given the right management strategy. We're really starting to move towards CT for people who are at higher risk of disease to make sure we've picked it up in the right people. In fact, in the last uh, National Guidance for Doctors uh, that came out, we're really starting to recommend that people who are at high risk because they've been exposed to silica, whether that's in a quarry, a hard rock mine, or in a coal mine, uh, if they've had a high or very high exposure rating uh, or if they've got any changes to suggest disease on their x-ray or any issues on their breathing tests that we really should be uh, examining these people with a CT. There's also increasing numbers of um, 
WorkSafe and Safe Work Australia uh, guidelines coming out saying people exposed on a regular basis in the course of their employment to silica need to have undergoing uh, regular screening, whether it's with an X-ray or in some jurisdictions they're moving towards CT. Uh, we did a, um, a study ourselves here in Queensland a couple of years ago. Uh, there was a joint um, effort between some of us here in Queensland as well as some of our colleagues in America. And what it demonstrated was that there was a significant number of people who had been imaged with CT you know, as part of the, a course of their investigation you know, years ago before all of this came to light. Uh, when we went back and looked at those images, there was a reasonable number of them had findings on there which should have been flagged if we had known then the information that we know now. Which goes again to show that even in our own population here, there is a benefit for getting the right people to do the job. Now, there's been a whole heap of work done in all the different dust uh, spaces here in Queensland. In engineered stone screening, in ex for example, um, we had over a thousand workers undergo mandatory screening. And um, as of July last year, I mean, that's a, a year old now, this data, um, that's 22% of that cohort had an accepted claim for lung injury related to their artificial stone exposure. Quite a few of them had really severe disease with the scarring or progressive massive fibrosis. Most of them, however, claimed to be asymptomatic. We also know that the chest X-ray was reported as normal. In 43% of the people who ended up having a CT and ended up being positive, that's pretty telling that particularly in people exposed to silica, the chest X-ray being normal really isn't that reassuring. And so we do a three-yearly three chest X-ray and then if you become a high-risk worker, just by duration of exposure, you end up moving to having a high-resolution CT scan every two years. So here's an example. He's a 34-year-old man. He's been exposed to engineered stone dust for 12 years. And you can see all these tiny dots there that shouldn't be there. And on the image on the right, nodules that are starting to form clouds, not just individual dots. This is telling me that this man is going to ex exhibit ex significant problems with his lung function um, very quickly. When we look at the mine dust lung disease, we can see that over the course of the last five years, the number of people coming forward uh, with symptoms and, and diseases for claims has gone up. If we're not testing people and we're not asking the question, we're not going to be identifying the people with disease. And it's a mix of things. It's emphysema, it's black lung, a combination of both. Sometimes it's silicosis, and still there are people exposed to asbestos. We do find over time that there are peaks and troughs in how many people are presenting. Um, five years ago, when we started screening people for black lung disease, everyone had to come forward and get screened. Um, we saw a, a, a rise in the number of cases then. People who have to have five yearly screening are presenting again now for their five year screens again. So, you know, we do see a bit of a cyclical arrangement there. Here's an example of someone with what we call complicated or quite advanced black lung. And all of those tiny dots on this CT scan picture in the top parts of the lungs, they're not dots anymore. They're actually big white masses starting to form together and pulling the lungs. This is a really advanced form of fibrosis. This person will be significantly symptomatic. Their exercise tolerance will be low. They will have trouble walking a few hundred meters. They may well be on home oxygen. This is a really nasty disease. And it's this sort of disease in, you know, in our workers, particularly young and middle-aged workers, that we are really trying to avoid. Here's another example of mixed disease. Here's a man who's worked in a number of industries. And we see this all the time, working in coal for a period of time, going to hard rock mine, coming back to coal over the course of a career, exposed to many different workplaces. Between 2014 and 2019, the x-ray went from being pretty normal, I wouldn't really have said much about it, to suddenly looking like, ooh, hang on, that looks like there's emphysema, there's scarring in the top of the lungs, you know, what's happening? we do a CT scan, all of those black areas where there's no lung, that's emphysema. 
emphysema just eats away at the lung tissue. And as time goes on and they get bigger, then the amount of lung volume you've got left to breathe with actually gets lower. And you can see that those big black holes, mostly at the top of the lungs, and when you don't have the ability to breathe in and out and actually expand your lungs because those holes don't move, that's when someone says, oh, I get a bit short of breath walking up the stairs nowadays. Maybe I'm just getting on a bit. Or actually, maybe you're only 40 and that's not normal and you should be healthier than this. So it's about educating and it's about identifying people who are at higher risk of developing these diseases. The other states of Australia have taken a similar approach, although I must say, Australia as a whole, leading the world, and Queensland leading the rest of the, of the country. So in Victoria, you know, they've done a big silica-associated um, registry. Um, they've got, you know, over 800 workers the last time I checked their registry, and 25% of them have, were diagnosed with silicosis, um, including quite a number of people with this complicated silicosis, that horrible disease pulling the lungs into scarring. Interestingly, again, 28% of people who had a CT scan that showed silicosis had had an X-ray that showed nothing. Again, demonstrating that in, in these high-risk people, we need to be identifying them with CT more and more compared to looking at them with X-ray. In New South Wales, Eye Care running their program, you know, they don't release as much data, but they have said that they've had over 107 cases of silicosis just in one year alone. And their diagnosis isn't really even based on CT, it's based on lung function testing, and they may also then have a chest X-ray. So that's a, a huge number of people diagnosed with disease in that cohort. Compare that to seven years in a row where they had 90 cases in total. So now that we're looking for it more, we're finding it more and more. And the numbers just keep going up. <coughs> Western Australia has taken a slightly different approach. Uh, they were screening everybody with chest X-ray and they hadn't found any cases by the end of 2019. And they said, well, there must be cases out there. We can't be immune over here. And so they ran a project looking at what happens when we get people back for a CT scan after they've had a normal X-ray. And what they found of the 90 workers who agreed to participate, eight of them, having had a normal x-ray, came back and had an abnormal CT. And they said, well, this is evidence that we should be looking harder for, what, uh, for what's out there. And as of the start of last year, every person in uh, Western Australia exposed to silica, although not in the coal mining industry, but in the silica-related industries as a separate group, uh, they will undergo uh, a five-yearly CT scan. And those who are exposed to the engineered stone products get it every two years. LD uh, CT, meaning the low dose uh, version of CT scanning. So overall, and this was summarised quite nicely in the national guidance for doctors put out last year, uh, we're finding that you know more and more people being diagnosed every year. Uh, we'd like to think that with all of the changes that have been put into place about uh, you know, reducing the dust level exposures, you know the new standards that we've heard about, all of those processes to make the workplace safer that we will start to see the risk in these workers go down. But we know that right now we have so many workers that have been exposed to dust for a long period of time already. And those people will remain at risk of developing these diseases you know, for the rest of their lives. So a whole heap of people have been working really hard to make it better for the future. And there's a few things that I think are really you know, making me optimistic about where we're going. Um, we've already got an analysis study um, that we're doing at IMED, which is where I work, uh, you know, comparing X-ray versus CT for engineered stone workers, and that's well underway already. Um, we are just about to start a research project um, at my research institute um, at IMED and the Wesley Hospital, comparing chest X-ray with CT in people here in Queensland who are undergoing their surveillance and screening program, either through the coal program or the silica program, and that can either be current or former workers, and that is about to get started now. And we know that in Western Australia, we do have some researchers that are looking into ultra-low dose CT uh, versus regular CT in people exposed to silica dust. <coughs> 
So I'm very hopeful that over the next couple of years we're start to, going to start seeing some really robust evidence that will help us uh, form our recommendations for any changes that we may make to our screening program, particularly for the workers that are at the highest risk. And I'll just throw this in at the very end, artificial intelligence is coming and the ability to use artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques, not just in reading the cases, but in identifying the patients who are at the highest risk is going to revolutionise what we do in the next five to 10 years as well. So there are many, many positives to take out of the work that has been done so far in the last five years. And certainly I think in the next five to 10 years, we're really going to see massive improvements in the safety levels for workers and how we diagnose them and how we manage them when we do diagnose these diseases. So thank you very much for your attention. Does anyone have any questions? I may have stunned you all into silence. I know there's a question at the back. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Dusty from GCG. Um, for those unfortunate workers who are overexposed to dust at work, it, it is somewhat comforting to know that there are improved techniques for, for early identification. Your comments were, though, that um, we're going to have more workers diagnosed and at an earlier age. Um, is there a role that CT plays in helping those workers remain in meaningful work going forward? Yeah, so what we know as well, it's not just about what does the CT show, it's, it's also a lot about what is it that they do in their job? So having that uh, information that the occupational physician can incorporate into that decision making about do they need to stop work? Can they continue working in a different role? Can they continue working in their current role? So those decisions are generally made in this multidisciplinary team environment. And it's a really important part of um, sort of, if you like, sort of finishing the process. It's not just about doing the screening, coming up with a report, and then saying, well, here's your, your report, do with it as you will. We need to actually give advice that's based around the whole picture. Um, CT will, will find more people with disease. We also know that not every, every patient with disease will progress. And what we don't want to do is bring out, you know, take people out of their employment, out of their career, if there's no reason to do so. And so there's a lot of evidence about when to take someone out of the, um, the workplace, there's also evidence to say that that decision is best made by that group of people all bringing in specialist expertise to their piece of the puzzle. So yeah, very much aware that I don't want to end anybody's career prematurely. There has to be a really good reason. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you very much. One more round of applause. Thank you. Um, we're just about to start our last break. So um, if you head back in for 3.15, we're a few minutes early. Um, but to acknowledge this break was sponsored by Met, Met, Meta Rock. Thank you, everyone.